Good afternoon, everybody. I, I'm very pleased to welcome you to the second event of the 2024 Future Proofing Europe series, which is sponsored by the Department of Foreign Affairs with the IIEA. And we're delighted to be joined today by Dr. Tiago Antunes, Secretary of State for European Affairs of Portugal, who will speak to us on getting ready for enlargement, the EU's homework. And he's been very generous to take time out of his uh, schedule to speak to us today. And uh, that's greatly appreciated, Dr. Antunes. Uh, Secretary Antunes will speak to us for uh, about 20 minutes or so, and then we will go to the question and answer uh, with our audience. Uh, as this is an online event, uh, you will uh, be able to join the discussion uh, using the Q&A function on Zoom. And uh, a reminder also that today's presentation uh, and the question and answer are both on the record. And please feel free to join the discussion on Twitter using the handle at IIEA. And we're also live streaming this afternoon's discussion. So a very warm welcome to all of you tuning in on YouTube. The, uh, in his address, um, Dr. Antunes will discuss the impacts of the upcoming enlargement, or one can say enlargements, on the functioning of the EU and how the EU must reform itself in order to prepare for such enlargements. Um, he will focus on the challenges and opportunities of an enlargement, enlarged EU, with particular emphasis on the timing, the scope, uh, the content and the processes of internal reform, as well as potential mechanisms to accommodate existing and prospective member states' participation in the European project. So let me introduce the Secretary of State on Tunis. Uh, he has held this position uh, since March 2022, but he has uh, a long distinguished record also as a lawyer. But prior to his current role, he was Secretary of State for the Presidency of the Council of Ministers between 2017 to 2019, in charge of the Portuguese government's lawmaking process and Secretary of State Assistance to the Minister for, um, to the Prime Minister uh, from 2019 to 2022, and was there responsible for the internal coordination of the government and its communication. And um, the Secretary of State holds a PhD in law from the University of Lisbon, is also an assistant professor at the School of Law and a lead researcher uh, at the Research Centre for Public Law. So with that, uh, Secretary of State, may I hand the floor over to you and we look forward very much to your address to us today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. It's uh, Thank you for having me. It's really a pleasure to take part in these uh, IIEA uh, lectures or discussions or exchanges of views. And, um, and particularly at this uh, moment in time, when we're almost three months away from the European elections and from the beginning of a new political cycle in the European Union. So this is really the perfect timing to look ahead and try to anticipate uh, the big issues and the big, big tasks that we will have to deal with in the coming uh, European mandate. And um, of course, it, there are always um, developments which are impossible to predict, considering, considering this uh, this European legislature, which is reaching the end, uh, two of the most consequential uh, events um, and the ones that the European Union has held to deal with were obviously impossible to predict five years ago. So the pandemic and then the war in Ukraine. But um, in spite of that, there are a number of issues uh, that we can already anticipate that will be uh, relevant. Obviously, we will need to step up our game in terms of defense. Um, we will have to um, make real this promise of uh, strategic autonomy. We will have to try to strike the right balance between the Green Deal and also a more the more traditional means of productions, etc. But for sure, one of the big uh, tasks ahead and one of the big challenges for the next uh, five years 
is the enlargement of the European Union. Um, and uh, not only the enlargement itself, but also the preparation that the EU needs to make in order to be ready to receive new members, to take on board new countries. And uh, this is what I would uh, like to focus on today is uh, enlargement and reform, this uh, tandem of what the member, not only what the, we know that the candidate countries have a big homework um, um, and a huge task in their hands to comply with all the Copenhagen criteria. And we are very demanding and very rigorous in assessing those criteria, particularly in what concerns rule of law and fundamentals. Um, and that is uh, very much right uh, that we do so. But then we also need to do our part and the EU's homework. So this is what I would like to uh, focus on um, today. So um, of course, as you all know, there's a new momentum for enlargement policy since, um, since well, two years ago, since the start of uh, the invasion of Ukraine by Russia. Um, uh, as you know, probably the, there was this promise made particularly to the Western Balkans back in 2003 in Thessaloniki that they of, of a European perspective. But then for almost 20 years, really not much happened um, until with the invasion of uh, Ukraine, um, there was really this new impetus into uh, the enlargement policy towards Ukraine, of course, and Moldova and Georgia, so the Eastern Trio, but then also towards the Western Balkans who were waiting uh, for uh, a long period. Uh, but in the beginning, um, so several decisions have been made, significant decisions regarding these countries, particularly last December, the European Council, the decision to open negotiations with Ukraine and Moldova. Um, but for a long time, we were we started evolving uh, at a, a much faster pace in terms of enlargement, but there was not much appetite to discuss the other side of the coin, that is the preparation, uh, the reform of the European Union in order to accommodate new members. And um, uh, there was a slight mention in the June European Council when candidate status, uh, in June 2022 European Council, when candidate status was granted to Ukraine and Moldova. Uh, at, uh, at, at that point, the leaders said, also taking into consideration the EU's cap uh, capacity to absorb new members. So this idea of the absorption capacity of the European Union was mentioned. Um, and, and in fact, it is already part of the Copenhagen criteria. It is one of the criteria, the capacity of the European Union to absorb new members. But then there was no follow up for, for a certain number of months. There was no follow up on this um, because obviously the issues that we will have to deal with in order to prepare uh, to accept new members are difficult to, um, to address and to deal with and to agree on what needs to be reformed. Uh, and for uh, a long period, um, my sense was that in the European Union, we were trying to avoid having this discussion and we're trying to push it further away um, in time. So back last year in May 23, I convened here in Portugal, in uh, Oporto, a meeting of the um, Atlantic member states, of course, uh, of which Ireland took part, of course. And we had, uh, and I put this topic on the agenda, the reform of the European Union in view of the enlargement. Um, and this was one of the first discussions. It was followed the following months in June by uh, a first discussion among the 27 during the informal uh, General Affairs Council in Stockholm. This was a very important uh, moment to start facing the issues that we will have to um, deal with in order to um, be prepared uh, for uh, enlargement. And then, of course, a big moment was the Granada summit in October 23 and the Granada declaration that stated that both the EU and future member states uh, need to be ready. So there's um, work that must proceed in parallel in the European Union and in the aspiring members Obviously, they need to um, step up their reform efforts, but the EU also uh, needs to lay the necessary internal groundwork and reforms. And then, um, just continuing in, in the timeline, in December 23, 
uh, so at the end of last year, um, the European Council conclusions are very clear in the sense that they have a heading for the first time, a heading saying enlargement and reform. So can, linking the two issues, creating this kind of tandem enlargement and reforms, uh, which was set in stone as of uh, December last year. And, um, and the leaders have said that work on both tracks should advance in, par in parallel and that both the future member states and the EU need to be ready at the time of accession. So both need to do our homework and that homework should be completed by the time or until uh, the uh, formal accession of these uh, new member states. And more, even more recently, last week, the European Council also adopted a resolution on um, deepening EU integration in view of future enlargement, also stating that these two strands must advance in parallel and that there are institutional and financial reforms that we need to um, proceed and, and uh, at the European Union level. So I would say that uh, by now, the, the first step in this endeavor has been completed, which is to uh, rubber stamp this idea that we need both things. We need to advance in terms of enlargement, which, which was stalled for many years, but now it's clearly gaining speed. Uh, but we also need to do our part. And we need to address the difficulties and the challenges and the problems that will arise from going from an European Union at 27 from uh, to an European Union with uh, 30 plus or 30 something member states. This will be a, a game changer. This will be a huge change with uh, major implications. And, um, and this will bring both challenges and opportunities. So regarding um, um, enlargement itself, obviously, uh, it brings benefits not only to the uh, countries which want to uh, join the European Union, but it's also a positive thing um, for the European Union itself. It's, as stated in the Granada Declaration, it's a geostrategic investment in peace, security, stability, and prosperity. It is also a moral imperative considering what's happening in Ukraine and the sacrifices that they're enduring because of their option to come uh, the European way. Um, and so it's really, uh, from a geostrategic uh, point of view, it's uh, something that we must do. Um, and uh, But it also brings challenges with it. And I think we must be very realistic and very serious and very blunt in facing those uh, uh, challenges. It's no good for the process to try to ignore them or try to hide them or pretend like they don't exist. Even if they're difficult um, to, um, to deal with, we must face them and, and try to start having these discussions in order to find solutions uh, for those problems. And of course, um, the challenges, there are security challenges because we would be importing into the European Union countries with disputed borders, uh, with breakaway regions, with ethnic rivalries. So this is one issue in itself, particularly considering Article 22, number seven, of the Treaty of the European Union, which establishes a mutual um, uh, cooperation and, and, and support clause. Uh, it's not like NATO, but it's, it's there. And we have to be uh, aware of these implications. Then on agriculture, the implications will be huge. Just considering Ukraine alone, it accounts for one quarter of the agricultural surface in Europe. So this will have a major impact on common agriculture policy. Also the um, per capita income of these candidate countries is extremely low. So this will also impact, for instance, cohesion policy and how cohesion funds are distributed. Um, also in what uh, concerns the freedom of movement and once uh, the, the freedom of movement happens with also these countries, the risk of brain drain, which we already see today in the European Union, will become much uh, bigger. And then there's uh, 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 an array of um, institutional implications. There will be a multiplication of vetoes of, of, of member states with veto power. And you know how uh, today it is already so much difficult to take certain decisions at 27. Imagine with 30 something member states, um, the number of possibilities of veto will uh, multiply. And then even considering uh, decisions which are taken by qualified majority voting, the, the weight of each country 
uh, and the real power of influence of each country will be uh, significantly impacted because considering, again, considering Ukraine alone, it once it enters, it will be the fifth largest country. So which uh, a huge impact in how decisions are made. Also an impact on the size of the commission um, and whether it is feasible or workable to have a commission with 30 something uh, commissioners and also on the apportionment of seats in the European uh, Parliament, because if obviously the number of seats is not enlarged, then several member states will have to decrease their number of MEPs. So there's uh, quite a, a number of uh, challenges ahead of us, but I believe we need to face them and start naming them and start figuring, way, figuring out ways to uh, overcome them. And when I mention all these um, problems, I don't mention them as an obstacle or a stumbling block uh, to enlargement. It's not aimed at slowing down enlargement, rather on the, on the contrary, it's, uh, these are challenges that we need to overcome in order to be able to um, enlarge. And uh, while ensuring the effectiveness and the capacity to act of the European Union. Um, so we need to avoid repeating the mistakes of the past, for instance, in the big bang enlargement of uh, 20 years ago, 2004, when we didn't prepare ourselves fully, and then we were stuck for many years in institutional uh, discussions and, and treaty change and blockages. And, and, um, and, and so we need to avoid this. We need to uh, make the homework, complete the homework before accession and create these uh, conditions uh, for us to be able to take decisions and be uh, effective and efficient in our uh, decision-making process and how we reform our policies, agriculture policy, cohesion policy, etc., cetera, um, in order to uh, have a functioning European Union, uh, enlarged but functioning European Union. And so we need to face this not to create difficulties on the enlargement, but in order to create the possibility of enlargement, the, the, the so-called absorption capacity. Um, so obviously, when we consider the reform process, it also brings with it challenges and opportunities. The biggest challenge is that um, to deal with some of the issues that I mentioned, um, we might need treaty reform or treaty change. And when we consider the issue of treaty change, in itself, it's a diff difficulty, and particularly in relation to Ireland, because there's a constitutional requirement to hold a referendum um, to each um, constitutional uh, reform. So, uh, and we know in the past how some of these uh, um, treaty changes have been uh, difficult and so, um, and, and traumatic even. So, what I would say to this is that um, first, we should not start this discussion by saying we need to change the treaties um, because uh, this would be um, a road to disaster, I, say, I would say, um, and it would prove counterproductive. So first let's agree on what we need to change and how we need to change it. And then once we agree on that, it will be, we will check if that requires treaty change or not. And even if it does, by that time, it will be much easier because we have agreed on what we need to do. Uh, but if we open, uh, uh, if we call for a convention like the European Parliament has done, and um, we start an open process to amend the treaties, um, it will be uh, really, we will, we will not, we will get stuck in the middle discussing um, bits and uh, bolts and, 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 and we will get nowhere. Uh, so uh, first let's discuss, con let's focus on content, not on procedure. Let's discuss what we, how we see the European Union evolving in the future, what governance model we want for the European Union. And then later on, we'll check whether what we can do in the framework of the current treaties and what might require treaty change, if that can be done through the accession treaties or through a, through a supplementary treaty, as has been proposed by some. Um, but we'll check that at the end. If we start by uh, opening a procedure to review the, the, the treaties, that will, we will get stuck and we will uh, reach nowhere. And, and, and also my second remark here would be that we need to do everything we can in the context or in the framework of the current treaties, exploring the leeway and the margin of the room of maneuver in the Lisbon Treaty. There are considerable, considerable mechanisms in the Lisbon Treaty which allow for some flexibility, 
So we should explore those. And to start with, we should explore those and then we'll see if that is uh, enough to solve the issues or if we need to go beyond that to reform the treaties. Of course, um, using these mechanisms such as passerelle clauses, enhanced cooperation, et cetera, it's, it makes it a little bit easier than the treaty change because for instance, it doesn't involve referenda, but it doesn't make it all that easy because they still, for instance, in what concerns pastoral clauses, it still requires unanimity. So we still need to find a consensus at 27 uh, in order to move from unanimity to uh, qualified majority voting. But this is something that we must uh, discuss. Also the, the um, talks on, on using pastoral clauses have increased recently. Um, once we started, uh, since we started discussing more seriously the uh, enlargement, because everyone realizes that having uh, 30 something uh, member states with veto possibilities would make it very difficult. And, and so moving to qualified majority voting makes sense. But we also have to check in what areas or what policies we should uh, do this, um, th uh, this advance in this way. Because most of the conversation so far on the use of passerelle clauses has been centered on the common security um, and defense policy. And I would say that that's probably the, um, the, the not the area where we should start at, because it's probably the area where there are most, uh, where we can see more uh, national interests at stake and, and, uh, and sovereignty um, perspective that might require or might lead member states to feel that they need the rule of unanimity. Whereas in some other areas, more connected to the internal market, um, it would make more sense to evolve to qualified majority voting. Areas like uh, tax, uh, like um, social policy, like energy, like environment, in those areas which are closely connected to the way the, the internal market function, I would say it makes more sense to use the best rate clauses than in an area of foreign policy where obviously national uh, interests are more um, relevant. Then I would also uh, mention that these are the challenges of the reform process, but there are the reform process in itself is also an opportunity to deal with issues that we would need to solve anyway, even regardless of enlargement. Uh, you see the protests from farmers uh, everywhere recently in Europe. Uh, so probably the common agriculture policy would need reform anyway, um, even in, outside the scope of enlargement, we would need to address how to reform this policy. Um, then you see how the veto power has been abused by some member states which use it not for that particular decision, but in order to get leverage to influence other decisions. So these crossed vetoes, or this, I would say not the use of veto power, but the abuse or the misuse of veto power, when you veto a certain uh, file, not because you're against it, but in order to block another decision or in order to get some um, advantage in another area, um, this is blocking a lot of, uh, of um, the European Union in a lot of areas. And so we need to try to address that as well and find solutions to overcome that. I would say that we need to start thinking of a kind of a reverse emergency break. So we have the emergency break for when the decision is to be taken by qualified majority voting, but a member state can invoke that there's a national interest at stake. Uh, we need when, for, for when we have unanimity, but it's being used, uh, misused, uh, then we should be able to have an emergency unblocker and, and proceed with the decision uh, and avoid that uh, uh, things get stalled. So this is things that we need to think about creatively and we need the um, contribution from, from academia, from think tanks to um, start thinking how we deal with these issues. Then of course on rule of law, we also see that uh, the rule of law mechanisms need improvement. And for instance, Article 7 uh, has been um, blocked and has proven impossible to, uh, to adopt a decision on, based on Article 7. So this is an area also where even regardless of enlargement, we would need reform anyway. So enlargement might be also an opportunity to address these issues which um, need reconsideration. So um, for this reform process, um, when, what, and how should we do it? 
so when I would say that um, we should start as soon as possible, uh, what we what is foreseen now is that in June the leaders will agree on a roadmap for reforms and um, and also so this will. Um, more or less give us an idea of what um, what the work during the next five years will be and how to synchronize the uh, steps taken on the enlargement track and on the reform tracks. Because ideally, this should advance in lockstep. So each step in terms of the accession processes should be matched by a step taken in terms of reforms or decision to reform aspects of the European Union. Uh, so these two processes should run in parallel. And ideally, they should be completed before the accession uh, of new member states, because otherwise it will become much more difficult to reform if instead of 27, we'll already have 28 or 29 or 30 uh, countries within the European Union. In terms of scope, what needs to be reformed? I have mentioned some institutional issues, uh, policies like agriculture policy. And there I would mention not only two aspects of the common agriculture policy, the access to markets. Uh, and for instance, we're seeing uh, already today one of the major impacts of what the membership of Ukraine would mean in terms of the access of their agricultural products into the European agricultural market and, um, and how farmers are reacting, particularly in neighboring countries, uh, badly to these imports of uh, grain and foodstuff. So this is one issue. And the other issue is how to uh, distribute uh, cap funds, common agriculture uh, policy funds, because as I said, with 25% of the agricultural surface in Ukraine, they would get uh, roughly um, a quarter of the funds of the current policy. So this would be uh, have a huge impact. Then on cohesion, as I've mentioned as, as well, uh, once these new member states, once these new countries become member states, statistically, all of us, existing current member states will become richer because the average, the EU average will be much lower. Um, and so the access to cohesion funds will be lower, even probably some um, net uh, receivers will become net contributors to cohesion policy. And, uh, but this not because these countries have become richer or more developed, but because overnight from one day to the other, as soon as the enlargement happens, statistically they are richer, but they are exactly in the same level of development. Um, and, and so this is um, something that goes counter to the objective of upward convergence. We need a convergence, but not to an average which is lower because of the accession of new member states. We need an upward convergence and we need to find solutions to guarantee that cohesion policy continues to ensure an upward convergence, even after we have enlarged. Then also, obviously, budget implications, and we will already need to tackle those uh, in the um, negotiations of the next MFF, the next multi-annual uh, multi financial framework for 28 to 34, because um, in this, um, considering this time frame, uh, we already need to um, take into account a possible enlargement happening during this time frame. So when we start to discuss the always difficult discussions of MFF, of the, the multi-annual budget of the European Union, we already will need to take into account um, the cost of the enlargement. And what I always mention is that um, enlargement will not be cost-free. This is something we must do. It is in our interest. We want it to happen, but it will have a price tag and we need to be ready, all of us, and we need to tell our citizens and, and, and be very honest about it and raise awareness to the fact that this will have a cost and we will need to be willing to pay. And for that, obviously, we need to revive the discussion as well, I believe, on new own resources of the European Union in order to account for these new responsibilities and these new costs that uh, we are already, even re again, regardless of enlargement, we are already asking more and more from the European Union. We are um, giving more responsibilities to the European Union. Whatever happens, we expect the European Union to respond. Um, and the budget is already being pre pressured by many new responsibilities and priorities. So we cannot over demand and underpay. We have to find uh, revenue sources for the European Union to be able to respond to all these uh, new tasks and challenges ahead. Um, 
And then in terms of uh, rule of law, also this is an issue that needs to be addressed and, and how to avoid a, a, a leveling down, not, not only in terms of uh, uh, rule of law, but also other standards, environmental standards, social standards. So enlargement cannot be a way to level down. So we need kind of a lock of current standards to make sure that those, um, obviously within the um, accession procedure, we are very demanding to for candidates countries to achieve the, um, the European standards and to meet these uh, um, the European acquis, but afterwards we need to make sure that there is no uh, leveling down and no backtracking on this. Uh, so there's a lot we need to discuss. And one last issue that I would like to raise is that in an enlarged European Union with more member states, more diverse member states, and member states that have different aspirations and different expectations regarding Europe, someone more Europe, but someone less Europe, we probably we'll need to have a more flexible setup, more flexible arrangements. And so we'll need to consider the issue of differentiation. We already have a lot of differentiation within the European Union, Eurozone, Schengen, um, enhanced cooperations in many areas. Um, but probably in the future, we will have to accept that differentiation will play a key uh, role and will be a key feature of a uh, future European Union with 30 plus member states. Um, and, and accept that this will be a reality and even go beyond the level of differentiation of flexibility that we already have. Because honestly, I don't believe that a, um, a, um, a single rule or a, um, a one size fits all uh, will, will be available in the future with more and more member states. We will need to account for the differences and for the um, different way uh, member states view the European Union. And so we'll probably need to address both external differentiation and internal differentiation. Do, so differentiation in the run up to becoming a member of the European Union. And there we can discuss gradual or sexual integration of candidate countries. Um, and the European Union has recently proposed regarding the Western Balkans, this growth plan, which um, foresees an increased level of funding, but also um, a an, an, an sexual integration into some European policies already on the way to enlargement, so that this is not an on or off situation, but gradually these candidate countries start to uh, train and be involved in some of the policies and some of the uh, methods. Um, but then also in, we need also to consider internal differentiation. So even once uh, they are in the European Union, we will probably need uh, more flexibility. This is why my Portuguese prime minister has proposed this idea of the European Union in the future as a multi-purpose building, which has um, on the foundations, the rule of law, fundamental rights, um, democracy, and this is unquestionable for all. Um, and, and is binding for all, of course. This is the foundations of the building. And then the building has a common area shared by all, which is a single market and other policies. But, any, but then it has different rooms and member states might choose to be part of certain rooms and not other rooms. And, um, and so um, this may account for uh, everybody's wishes and it will be a setup in which everyone will feel comfortable. Those who want to integrate further can go into more rooms and share more powers and more policies. Those who are comfortable with the level of integration that we have remain as they are. And probably some might uh, like to be less integrated in one or two areas and they might wish to do so. Um, so this is something that is a bit different from this idea of concentric circles of a European Union of concentric circles, which has been voiced many times, because this is not about creating a first tier and second tier or a, a core and a periphery. This is not about excluding anyone. So everyone is in this house and gets to choose freely which rooms they want to participate in, which policies they want to be part of. Uh, so everyone participates in an, on an equal footing there is no forced waiting room for new member states. No, everyone is in and gets to choose if they want to share more or less. Um, and obviously, if they want to participate more, they will have to fund more, and, but they will uh, take part in the decisions. 
but if they don't want to be part of certain policies, then they are also um, open to do so, uh, provided that they obviously respect what is common and the foundations, the rule of law, etc. So this is an idea that we've been um, working on, and I believe that I believe will be key for a future union, uh, which will be larger. And therefore, it will need to be more uh, flexible to account for everyone's wishes. Thank you. So I'll stop here and um, eager to listen to your questions. It's Secretary of State. Um, that, that was an extremely comprehensive and interesting um, tour d'horizon of the, of the whole enlargement challenges. And also, I think uh, you, you stressed the opportunities uh, so I think your whole address has has an optimistic uh, flavor to it, which I think is the way we need to to approach this with with the candidate countries. Uh, I have uh, some questions. I have uh, a question from um, James C. O'Shea from our Department of Foreign Affairs, and he asks, what lessons, if any, has the EU learned from the 2004 enlargement? Uh, which included Cyprus, about accessions of new member states with territorial disputes and our separatist regions. And of course, we are thinking here of uh, uh, a number of, of the Balkan states with territorial disputes uh, and significant territorial disputes. Um, do you think that we have gained uh, some uh, information as as to how we can deal with with uh, states with difficulties like this as we go forward uh, for the next enlargement. Oh, thank you for the question. That's a really difficult one because uh, yes, on the one hand, um, we should be aware that the fact that we have these territorial disputes, the separatist regions, etc makes it more difficult to consider the accession of uh, these uh, member states. Uh, because once they're in, they'll be part of the union, and then Article 22.7 applies, as I was mentioning before. And, um, and so this brings with it a, a lot more uh, security risks that we need to be uh, aware of. And ideally, this would be solved before accession. So ideally, we would find a way of reconciliation in certain cases or of overcoming these disputes and these conflicts before um, entering uh, these, these countries are ready to enter the European Union. Although one can say, on the other hand, that, well, Cyprus has may function as a, a precedent in terms of the not being necessary to solve that in order to enter the European Union. And um, this is what these uh, candidate countries are saying. Um, you cannot put this as a requirement to enter because you have accepted Cyprus with an open, um, unresolved uh, territorial dispute. But we see how that makes it difficult in many areas in our relation with Turkey, etc., and the, the, the problems it has caused. So ideally, we should be... Um, we should try, we should strive to have a solution uh, to these uh, problems uh, and a settlement of these issues before um, we share our union uh, with new member states. But then again, um, nobody knows how long the conflict with um, Russia will take place. Um, and nobody knows how it will be settled in the end. And still Russia will still be there close to uh, Ukraine. Um, so there will always be a sense that we, as we enlarge, we are getting closer to this other foreign policy, which is increasingly hostile. Um, and this is something that also will change the nature of the European Union. Uh, we all now realize how we have to step up in terms of defense, um, also because of the concern that a future president of the United States will not be so much engaged with NATO. Um, but um, the fact that we are getting closer to a dangerous foreign power will uh, force us to obviously um, consider that in, in a much more serious way uh, as we um, approach uh, the future of the European Union. Um, security issues, foreign common and security policy will uh, become more and more relevant. But then again, we should not also not only uh, we should be 
also uh, able not to focus only on the East and on the Eastern uh, threat or menace, we should be able to have a, a full-scale uh, 360 uh, foreign policy and, um, and, and consider also engagement with Africa, with Latin America, with Asia, with other areas of the world. So we shouldn't be just stuck on areas in which we have a potential conflict uh, or real conflict going on. So um, it's all of this is very difficult at the at this moment in time. We don't know how things will evolve, but uh, obviously we we should. This is also a reason to be um, careful in relation to enlargement, not putting in question that enlargement should take place and should take place with the Eastern Trio, of course. But it will raise a certain number of issues for which we need to be uh, prepared. Thank you very much for your, your comprehensive reply to that. I have another question, um, Secretary of State, from Ethna McDermott, an IIEA member. And she asks, what concrete steps can the EU take to ensure that potential new members do not play a negative role after accession and replicate uh, the behavior of current member states like Hungary? Yes, this has to do with the uh, issue that I was uh, uh, mentioning earlier about not lowering the standards, both rule of law standards, but also other standards. Because uh, obviously in the way up to accession, so during the enlargement process, this is one of the key areas in which we are very uh, demanding and rigorous, which is the fundamentals cluster, rule of law, democratic values, um, minority, rights of minorities, etc. And we, uh, so a lot has to be, the, the standard to enter the European Union is very high in what concerns all these areas re uh, related to the rule of law. But then we also need to have instruments to tackle this after the, these uh, countries are in the European Union and become members. And, and there, what we've seen is that the current mechanisms aren't as effective as they should be. And so we need to ensure that the rule of law is not something, not only something that we need to comply with in order to enter the European Union, but it's a permanent requirement of being a member of the European Union. And therefore, we obviously need to um, improve our rule of law mechanisms and um, create kind of a clause of no regression. Um, so that the, the standards need to increase as these countries progress towards the um, membership of the European Union, but then they shouldn't be able to go uh, below that uh, also when they're already within the European Union. And so we need to find solutions, kind of a lock of standards or no regression um, to make sure that this is not something that we tick the box to enter and then we free. No, this has to be a permanent requirement. And we already have instruments for that, as you all know, in the European Union, but those have to be reinforced and improved for sure. Thank you very much indeed. I just have a question on the um, forthcoming European parliamentary elections and what we see as a, a, a swing to, to the right in many European countries. If the European parliamentary elections produce right-wing uh, parties or uh, parties in that direction, what effect do you think, Secretary of State, that might have on enlargement because of the um, significant influence of the European Parliament now in, in very many decisions? Do you think that that would threaten enlargement or, or you, do you see um, any danger from, from uh, a somewhat different European Parliament after June? Yes, we are very much concerned with the surge of the extremes and particularly with the extreme far right, populist right uh, uh, parties um, and the effect that might have in the next European Parliament. Um, of course, trying to be not so pessimistic, the current polls, they tell us that there will be the, the main traditional center parties, let's say, will lose some, uh, but they will keep the majority. Uh, 
Um, and so although there will be a rise and increase in the extremes, uh, it will not undermine, will not affect the current pro-EU majority that has had the, the, the main of the European Parliament in the past, and it will foreseeably continue to be so in the future. So this is a guarantee that on key issues such as enlargement and others, there will be a pro-EU majority, um, but this is what the polls are telling us. And let's see what happens on the 9th of June. In any case, it is a source of concern that these populist views, and, and not only populist, but most of them nationalistic views, so anti-EU views, uh, are on the rise. And this is obviously a key uh, threat and a key danger uh, for the European Union that we need to be uh, very much aware of. Thank you indeed for that. And um, the Director of Research at the IIA, Barry Colfer, uh, well, thanks you for um, uh, an excellent um, talk. Uh, he asks, can you please share any practical examples that you have of how countries that are on the way to joining can be most effectively involved in EU processes and policy communities in advance of joining? Uh, is what has been done in the past twinning programs enough or are there any other creative ways that um, new members could begin their integration journey? Yes, I think that we need to be seriously consider this uh, incremental accession, this idea which is also mentioned in the um, European Parliament resolution of last uh, week. Um, and I believe that one very practical example can be the proposal that the Commission has already put forward of this growth plan for the Western Balkans. Because it, um, it is, on the one side, increasing uh, gradually the access, the intensity of funds, uh, so that there is, um, because if we limit the funds, pre-accession funds, and then we grant 100% of access to funds once these countries are in, it, this will be a major jump that will be also difficult to execute all this funding and to absorb all this funding. So it should be gradual. That there should be a gradual phase in of funding. There should be also a gradual phasing of um, belonging and taking part of certain policies and of the internal market, for instance, gradual access to the internal market, uh, access to the European Union uh, payment zone, a single payment zone. Um, there are many um, in, in terms of energy, in terms of, um, uh, for instance, roaming uh, charges, lowering the roaming charges. Uh, this all, these are all things that are already uh, happening to some extent with the Western Balkans, with the Western Balkans progressively, and this is, uh, I believe, uh, uh, the good method to have this um, gradual progress uh, towards uh, accession. Of course, then we have to be mindful that of the um, balances and the offsets here, because if we grant all the benefits before uh, membership, then there will be no incentive to um, go, go the full way um, and comply with all the criteria that uh, we uh, demand in order to uh, become a member state. Um, so we need to take into account the incentive structure so that there is always um, a, a, an increased benefit of um, progressing into the European Union, but it should be gradual. Then one other thing that should be gradual, but that is more difficult, is the uh, institutional participation in the organ, in the bodies and institutions of the European Union. This is more difficult pre-accession because formally, not being a member, um, these countries are not allowed to take part in the decisions. Um, and even uh, some have mentioned possibly uh, the possibility of inviting these countries as observers. That might be possible in the parliament. For instance, the Social Economic Council is going ahead with this. Uh, the committee on social, uh, social Economic Committee is going ahead with this, inviting observers from the candidate countries. But in the council, it's much more difficult. Um, but um, so legally um, speaking, it's more difficult to to um, for this to happen. But it sh it would be interesting also to have some forms of uh, gradual participation in the institutions. Um, in any case, 
uh, I think I've given a few examples of how this can be done, this idea of um, external differentiation and fa gradual phasing in to the European Union. And I guess this is the way to go because it shouldn't be an on or off. It should be really a, a, a staged uh, process. Thank you. Thank you. I think that has some very positive suggestions for the um, uh, for going forward with the applicants. Uh, our De Deputy Director General Jill Donoghue has a question. Firstly, she thanks you for a very refined and carefully crafted presentation on the challenges and opportunities of enlargement. She asks, um, Secretary of State, to your point on strategic communication with citizens on the costs of enlargement, which, as you have said, are very significant. Uh, I think, in fact, uh, the costs of enlargement have been estimated by the General Secretariat study as 257 billion in seven years, which is 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 a, a very, very high. So she asked, how might this be presented to EU citizens so that it does not negatively impact on the European Parliament elections? Yes, so uh, it will be difficult because um, most citizens are more focused on bread and butter issues and, and, um, and being presented with a huge price tag will uh, be uh, will have an impact, of course, and we need to avoid that. And uh, but we we need to also be serious with the population, with the voters, with the citizens, and not try to hide the impacts of enlargement. So this is my main point here today: is uh, that we should be very open and transparent about the implications of enlargement, not in order to create problems, but because we need to overcome this to make the enlargement a reality. And this is relevant between member states in the institutions, but it all it is also relevant when in our outreach towards the citizens. Um, of course, we need to be very careful in how we do this in order not to scare the citizens and create a backlash and anti-enlargement sentiment. And um, and this is particularly sensitive uh, when we are so close to European elections. Um, we are also this is quite relevant as well, we are also still awaiting the input of the European Commission, because so far it has been the Council uh, in the Granada Declaration and then the December European Council, and now recently the European Parliament to get involved into this discussion. But the Commission so far has um, not really uh, taken part, and it's the Commission that has the most data uh, and um, and will be able to bring more input into uh, the impacts of enlargement into several uh, policy areas. So we need this, but of course, I believe the commission is a bit wary of um, bringing a lot of information to the public now in the wake of um, Euro the European elections. So we are awaiting a, a communication from the commission, but I believe that at this point, the commission is trying to avoid anything that might create problems, and I understand why. Um, so it's, it will be really only after the elections that we will start discussing uh, seriously these implications. But um, so I, I don't have a, a direct answer to this question, but um, we need to tell to start having these conversations with the citizens, but we need to avoid scaring them. Uh, so it has to be very carefully crafted um, so that we don't just pretend like the problems don't exist. That wouldn't be serious. And further down the road, the citizens will would uh, um, take into account the, the, the reality. Um, but, um, but we need to be honest and transparent, but avoiding uh, an anti-enlargement sentiment, which would not be positive. Yes, thank you. Thank you for that. Obviously, the financial question is, is a huge issue and uh, the own resources, of course, uh, comes into it, which uh, brings it very much back to the member states. I have another question here, um, Secretary of State. How effective is the MED9 framework for deepening cooperation between Portugal and other like-minded countries, say on enlargement of the Balkans? I mean, does Portugal see the region as very much a geostrategic priority? Yes, I believe that regional groups of coordination within the European Union are very useful in general. They make sense. So we are, uh, from the beginning, part of this MED9 uh, group. It wasn't a group of nine countries in the beginning, so it has enlarged 
uh, towards the um, uh, the, Mediter the the Eastern Mediterranean, um, and 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 necessarily uh, the the issue of the, the the Balkans, the Western Balkans, has become more relevant in this setting as well, because obviously it's a um, a major issue for Slovenia, for Croatia, which are the new members of the Med Nine. Uh, but also, I would like to mention this group, um, which had its inaugural meeting last year, that I mentioned, the Atlantic Group, the group of the Atlantic member states, or the Western facade uh, of the European Union, which is also important because when we have clearly the balance tilting towards the east, this is very much so after the big enlargement of 2004, and it will be even more so after once these enlargements that we are discussing now will become a reality. So we also need to take into account also the more Western perspective of the European Union in order to have a balance. So all these regional views of the South, of the West, um, they need to be taken into account in order to balance obviously the focus that is um, very much on the East, which is understandable, particularly since the war in Ukraine, obviously the focus is there and needs to be there, but we also need to take into account other views. And so all these groups, the Mad Nine for sure, this Atlantic group, um, are um, they bring new added value uh, to the European discussions. Yes, thank you. Um, look to East as well as to West. Uh, some uh, Somewhat of a political question. Uh, of course, the war in Ukraine is dominating um, uh, everybody's uh, views at the, or everybody's um, preoccupation at the moment. But I wonder, are you conscious in looking to the member states or the applicant member states that, in fact, there's some race here uh, against Chinese and Russian influence in those states, particularly in the economic and industrial area? Well, yes, enlargement is also uh, important because if we do not uh, satisfy the expectations that we ourselves have given to these countries, then others will occupy that space. And uh, Russia, China, it said other powers which are gaining influence. And um, if we do not engage, if we do not fulfill on the promises that we've made, um, if, uh, if, if enlargement does not, does not progress and go through, then obviously we are leaving open space for these other powers to gain influence on our close neighborhood. That is something that obviously we uh, need to avoid happening. And this is obviously part of the geostrategic importance and priority of enlargement for sure. Yes. And uh, a last question, because unfortunately we're running close to time. Um, Charles Michel feels has uh, said uh, that uh, the EU institutional reform, the internal reform, uh, could be um, completed by well in time for 2030. Do you feel we can reform ourselves in time to receive new members by 2030? Well, I feel we should avoid setting artificial dates um, on a process that is in itself um, merit-based. And so it depends a lot on how these countries will progress in terms of achieving the milestones, the benchmarks, the um, the aki, et cetera. So it, it would be, I believe, uh, risky and counterproductive to say that enlargement needs to be completed by 2030 or some other date. So we should not set to ourselves artificial dates um, that, uh, that then could lead, if they are not met, they could lead to uh, even furthering and growing the frustration, which is already uh, there in certain, particularly in the Western Balkans, who have been waiting for much longer. There's a sense of frustration building up. And if we now say, okay, wait until 2030, and then it doesn't happen in 2030, it will, this frustration will only grow. So we need to avoid this, but we need to, um, not let go of this issue. We need to uh, really um, take this on board and 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 start uh, this process of reforming and 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 be serious about it and 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 make progress and ideally during the next mandate, during the next uh, uh, term, um, it will be decisive. It will be key to um, to for us to agree on what kind of reform uh, we want. Even if we're not able to complete it by then, we should have an idea of, 
of the direction of travel and, and, and the objective of uh, what the future in large European Union should look like. And this is why this roadmap that will be um, adopted in June uh, by the leaders, uh, the roadmap for reform is very important. Very important to, um, on one hand, to uh, make clear this linkage between enlargement and reform, and that it should go in lockstep, hand, hand in hand, and, 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 and progress should be made um, on, on both tracks. And on the other hand, to uh, make real and, and, and visible that we are serious about this process and we will try to complete it during um, the next legislature. Uh, but then again, we can have tentative calendars. We should never have a fixed date um, because um, if we fail to achieve uh, reform and enlargement by then, it would only be worse. But we need to be serious about the process and try to uh, try to go over it uh, in the next European term. Thank you very much indeed. And Secretary of State, we have reached our, our time limit. I know definitely we could continue this conversation for a very long time, but I want to thank you most sincerely on behalf of all of us and all the participants today. I think we've learned uh, a great deal from your very clear outline of the advantages and the processes involved. And I think what you have left with us is a very positive outlook for the future, uh, for the with the benefit of uh, the uh, enlargement and what they will bring and a kind of confidence that uh, the existing member states uh, can draw on uh, to make that happen. So our sincere thanks to you and our good wishes to you for the future. Many thanks. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure being with you.